Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. This week's Our World program comes from Canada, where Usha Lee McFarling sends this report on how global warming is affecting the behavior of polar bears and creating problems for the town of Churchill, which depends on the bears for tourism. The Hudson Bay polar bears are an unusual group. They spend half their year living on the frozen sea ice. And in a normal year, around springtime, when the weather gets warmer, the bears move on to land as the sea ice begins to melt. Once they have done this, their lives enter a new phase, which involves a change in their metabolism. They don't hibernate, but their bodies slow down because they won't eat for the next six months. During this half of the year, they lose hundreds of pounds in weight. Each autumn, as the temperature falls, the bears migrate past the small town of Churchill, waiting for the Hudson Bay to freeze over again. When it has, the bears go back onto the sea ice. Now they can build up their fat reserves by feeding on seals. They survive because the surface of the Hudson Bay is normally frozen from mid-October through to mid-April. During these months, the bears sleep on ice floes and swim in the frigid waters. Normally, that means millions of dollars for the town of Churchill, which earns money by taking tourists into the tundra to see the bears as they pass by the town. However, recently the weather has been warmer and the bears' behavior has changed. The warm weather prevents the sea from freezing, and so the hungry bears come into town looking for food. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. The town of Churchill has good reason to look after the bears. Rough estimates indicate the province of Manitoba earns in the region of $300 million each year from bear tourism. Bears are the backbone of our economy, said town manager Darren Ottaway. While Ottaway is concerned about an abundance of hungry bears coming to town in the short term, he is even more worried that global warming may mean no bears here at all one day. For three weeks during bear season, Sleepy Churchill blooms as about 15,000 tourists stream through town, hoping to get close-up views of the animals from caravans of heated tundra buggies. Several chartered jets unload bear gazers at the Churchill Airport each day. Hotels and restaurants closed during the bleak winter filled to capacity. Polar bears are not currently an endangered species. Their total population is estimated to be from 22,000 to 27,000. But the 1,200 Hudson Bay bears could face what scientists call a local extinction. They could produce fewer cubs and eventually die out. Officials and business leaders in Churchill have already begun planning for alternative ways of generating income. Ottawa is promoting whale watching and is delighted that Japanese tourists are willing to brave the bone chilling cold of winter to view the northern lights. It's super news for us, Ottawa said of the potential Japanese tourist boom. Warmer weather, Ottawa said, could also extend the shipping season on Hudson Bay and attract more filmmakers. The science fiction classic Iceman was filmed nearby, as well as an upcoming film, The Snow Walker. When people talk about climate change, you have to look at the benefits, too, Ottaway said. Others, however, feel differently. The bears have been in our community for years, said one resident. 
They're like neighbors, and everybody ought to be helping to make sure their natural life cycle can be maintained. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Come in, John. Come in. How's the paper going? Morning, Mr. Taylor. Pretty well, actually. Good, good. It's not all about bicycles, is it? I know you've got a thing about bicycles. Yes, but that's just... There are other ways to get around town, you know. Yes, I know, and I think I've researched pretty well all of them. Right, then. So your paper's about urban transport in London, eh? Not just London, but that is going to be the focus. I've also looked at urban transport systems in cities around the world. Madrid, Beijing, Mexico City, Amsterdam, Paris, other countries too. You have been busy, haven't you? What's the purpose of your study? Well, two things really. I want to see if there are more efficient ways of organizing urban transport systems while cutting down on traffic congestion, and of course pollution, and to find ways of encouraging people to use public transport instead of their cars. Let's start with that then, with cars. I think you have a hard time thinking of ways to persuade people to swap their cars for a crowded bus or underground train they're convenient, comfortable, faster, and sometimes they're a status symbol, too. Okay, I agree that cars will probably always be the most popular means of transport, but there are ways to cut down the number of people who bring their cars into the city. It's a problem that affects every big city, and several methods have been tried. I know, I know, as I've found to my cost. When I go into London, which I do two or three times a week, I have to pay five pounds to get into the city centre. Has your research thrown up any more places where they do this? Oh, yes. Apart from London, there's Oslo, Stockholm, Singapore. Now, there, in Singapore, they've got it really organised. They've imposed a tax on all roads leading into the city centre and they have electronic sensors that identify each car and then debit a credit card belonging to the owner. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. And other cities, instead of charging motorists to come into the city center, have tried other measures. Such as? Well, in Athens, cars are only allowed to go into the city center on alternate days, depending on their license plate number. In Bogota and some other Latin American cities, such as Quinto and Sao Paulo, they've developed what is called a BRT system. A what? A BRT system, 
a bus rapid transit system. People leave their cars outside the city and take buses, which have special express lanes into and through the city. It's been so successful that they're trying it out in Mexico City, Beijing, Seoul, and Taipei. And other cities are pedestrianizing more and more areas of the city center. I see. How have these measures affected traffic congestion and pollution levels? In most cases, it has led to a reduction in the number of cars entering the city center. Certainly in Singapore, where it's now much easier to move around the city and the air is much cleaner than most other cities in that part of the world. London, too, I believe. I can give some facts and figures if you like. Please do. In the first year after the tax was introduced, the number of people using buses to get to the city center rose by 38%. Really? 38%? Incredible. Yes, and the number of cars entering central London dropped by about 18%. There's more. The number of people using bicycles and mopeds went up 17%. I knew we'd get to bicycles at some point. Well, yes. In the city, the bicycle has a lot going for it. You can avoid traffic jams. There are no parking problems. They don't pollute. They're cheap to run, and they don't cost very much. Oh, and here's another fact for you. You can fit 20 bicycles in the space needed to park one car. Well, I never. But I can't see it catching on. Besides, we seem to be getting off the point. Not at all. China, Japan, and Holland have all integrated bicycles into their urban transport systems. In Holland and Japan, they've got special parking areas for commuters who get to the station by bike. And Japan has even built multi-story parking facilities for bikes close to railway stations. Then look at America. In New York, delivery services use bicycles because they can deliver messages and small parcels far more quickly and at much lower cost than cars or vans. Even the police use bicycles. In fact, in about 80% of the towns in America where the population is around half a million, the police regularly patrol on bicycles. And they have proved to be effective because they can reach the scene of an accident or crime faster and more quietly than officers in patrol cars, making a lot more arrests per officer. Well, you do know your bicycles, don't you? but I do need to hear more about the public transport system and what's to be done about that. And I'd like you to look a bit more into the economics of it, how much it will cost to improve the situation, and so on. Okay? Right. See you next Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. Bye, Mr. Taylor. That is the end of Part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Dylan and Emily, discussing a presentation which they will have to make. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. OK, Emily, as you know, we've got to do this presentation together. 
I know, I'm a little bit nervous about it, standing up in front of all those people. And what if the presentation fails? What if... Don't worry. I've been reading a book about giving effective presentations. It's not that hard, but the way to do it is certainly not always obvious either. For example, do you know what the most important part of a presentation is? The final summary, I guess. The opposite. The first minute, in fact. The theory says that that first minute is when you win or lose the audience. If you lose them at that point, you'll probably never get them back. So that's why you need a hook. A hook? You mean like when you catch fish? Yes. I mean, not exactly, but yes, we want to catch the audience, right? So we need to start in a way which wakes them up, gets them interested and makes them watch us. I see. Basically, no matter how good our presentation is, if the message doesn't get across, the presentation fails. So we need to give a fact which really amazes them, or an interesting story, or pose a dilemma which makes them think, something they can really puzzle over. It's better if this is related to the subject, of course. Something to do with management, in our case. So that's the hook. That's right. From then on, we'll just follow the basic advice. Like what? Like, talk to your audience, you know, as equals. Don't talk down to them, or up to them. They're just the same as us, right? You're right, you know. Some of the best presentations I've ever seen sounded just like conversations. Exactly. And what else made them good? Well, the speakers sort of involved me in the topic and issues under discussion by asking questions, by uh, referring to me, you know, by saying you and, well, basically they were interesting. And they're exactly the tips we'll follow too. It should be fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Emily, I think this will be a fine presentation, but how are we going to divide it up? For example, who's going to open it, you or me? Well, I think you have a very natural style, so you should start. This talk has five main parts, so you can introduce it and then do part one. That's the historical context or background to the issue. Yes, then I'll do part two about current views. You do part three and I'll do part four, leaving both of us to handle the question time. I'm OK with that. In part one, I'll probably speak at length about Hoffman's theory, about management styles and compare differences in culture in relation to the style of management used. That sounds good. Those differences are important and certainly relevant to the current times. Hoffman makes some excellent points too on this issue. That's why I'll follow up with present-day perspectives and viewpoints on this, such as the problems facing today's managers in the complex multicultural workplace, where basically one can no longer assume one is dealing with a single culture in the workplace, but actually a multiculture. That sounds good also. Then I'll take over, discussing the implications and problems of this. I suppose you'll look at the pluralist movement. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but then I changed my mind. I've decided I'll look at the productive diversity argument. It's more interesting anyway, so I'll go with that. Then I'll tell everyone what we've decided is the best business practice, or what is most likely to work in most situations, which is basically ignoring pluralism and productive diversity and linking everything back to Cotter's theory of human universals. Yes, the theory that argues modern management should target the universals of human nature. Right, and that leaves both of us to field questions at the end. Are there any questions we can predict so that we have some good answers ready about resolving industrial disputes, for example? Well, 
I'd say that industrial democracy usually surprises people, so we should expect a lot of questions about that. Yes, the theory is that it increases productivity and reduces industrial delays, and results in better decision making. But that's all theory. Most people would think that industrial democracy is just about unworkable in practice. So let's be ready to explore that issue in some depth, as well as any other related topics. Okay? Okay. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Great Barrier Reef. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Despite its name, the Great Barrier Reef isn't just one large coral reef. Rather, it's a system of coral reefs that stretches along the east coast of Australia, covering an area of around 300,000 square kilometres. The Great Barrier Reef is composed of approximately 3,000 individual reefs, which range in size from one hectare to more than 10,000 hectares each. In addition, Around 600 islands are scattered throughout the area, particularly at the northern and southern ends. The reefs themselves are composed of over 400 different kinds of coral, the largest variety of corals found anywhere in the world. Thousands of species of sea animals live in and around the reefs. Altogether. Approximately 1,500 species of fish inhabit the reef area, including a number of different kinds of sharks. One of the more interesting mollusks to be found in the reefs is the giant clam. This huge shellfish can live for more than a hundred years and can weigh as much as 200 kilos. Sea mammals abound in the area, which serves as a breeding ground for certain types of whales, many of which are endangered. Over 200 species of sea and shorebirds feed, roost, or nest among the reefs and islands. Many types of reptiles can also be found living among and near the reefs. Saltwater crocodiles, for example, inhabit the marshes along coastal areas. Amphibians include at least seven species of frogs inhabiting the islands of the reef. Unfortunately, this wondrous area of the world is threatened by climate change. Rising sea temperatures have led to an effect called coral bleaching, that is, large numbers of corals dying off, especially in the shallower areas of the reef. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority is attempting to find effective ways to deal with this issue that threatens the reef. One proposed solution involves shading the reef in certain areas to help keep the surrounding water temperatures down. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.